Hi, uh, AJ Hartley here, Shakespeare professor, novelist. No, let's do that the other way around. Novelist, Shakespeare professor, baby metal fan, uh, among other things. Today, I'm going to talk about a, a few things. Some of it's going to be about baby metal. Some of it's not. So if that doesn't interest you, skip. Um, this is really just a kind of a general update on things that I'm involved in um, and various projects uh, and where things are, are heading, um, which I thought people might be interested in. And if they're not, that's okay. Um, to start with, let me talk about Dragon Con. Um, so I f I'm not certain how long it's been going, 35 years or something like that. There's a huge fan-based, fan-driven convention, mostly science fiction and fantasy, in Atlanta, Georgia on Labor Day weekend. I have been going for, I don't know, 15 years, but I did not go last year. Obviously, the, con the convention was shut down because of the pandemic. I didn't go the previous year for other uh conflict because of other conflicts but i will be there again uh, this year and um i'm going to be on a whole bunch of different panels uh mostly as a as a novelist as a writer <coughs> uh but also you know this is a a um a popular culture convention and for the first time ever one of the tracks within the convention, which is, is called the Silk Road track, which focuses on Asian cinema and culture, is going to be doing a baby metal panel, which is super cool, right? And the panel will be moderated by the leader of the track, uh, and it will feature myself and um, Paul and Kevin from the Baby Metal Podcast, who you may be familiar with. Unfortunately, Maggie... Um, can't be there this uh, this weekend. So um, I'm talking. I'm, I'm going to post this probably tomorrow, which is Friday. So it will be a week from the day I post this, the third of September, I think at two thirty in the afternoon. Let me pull up the full schedule and I will show you. So this is uh, my uh, the page on my website. I'll include the link to this in the description below. Um, and uh, as I say, so the first thing that we have listed is the Dragon Con um, Baby Metal Panel, which is at 2.30 in the Hilton. Uh, as, if you know Dragon Con, there's like five convention hotels in the downtown Peachtree area. And, uh, you know, in previous years, there have been something like 80,000 people there. Uh, I expect the numbers will be reduced this time, and the convention is taking pandemic precautions. Everybody has to be vaccinated or have proof, proof of a test, um, a COVID test, within the last 72 hours. So you might want to look, if you're going to come, you might check out their uh, their website to make sure that you're 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 clear but and you'll have to get a pass of course for the convention you can't just walk in for a single panel you gotta get a, a, a day pass at very least but the convention is a huge party and there's tons and tons of stuff to do i strongly recommend it as i say i've been going for a long time so the baby metal panel uh, is called 10 years of baby metal as you would expect uh, given where we are and um, there'll be a lot of conversation about who the band are um, and we're going to use a few clips you know I don't know what the audience is going to be it may be people who know everything inside out about baby metal and it may be people who are uh, shall we say <laughs> baby metal curious um, so it will be a mixture of sort of information and inspiration and discussion and chat. And I'm sure people are going to want to talk a lot about, you know, the <laughs> the recent announcement about the hiatus um, and and what's going to come next uh, or not going to come next. I, I'm, I should say I'm not particularly worried about that. I, I, I saw a lot of people losing their minds over the announcement. But to me, that's classic baby metal lore. We knew that this 10-year anniversary um, mark was coming and that it was going to involve some kind of closure. Uh, I don't think it means the end of the band. I think it means some sort of break. And I'm sure this has all been intensified by the pandemic as well, right? Um, that 
of course they can't play live, you know, so they're gonna they had to go on hiatus. And let's be honest, they're on hiatus most of the time. Why people suddenly lose their minds when they say we're going on hiatus, I don't really know. Um, but I fully expect them to come back. I'm looking forward to new music and to shows, and we shall see. So, you know, this I'm sure will come up in the course of the panel, but it'll be a fun opportunity. And of course, at Dragon Con, loads of people, loads of people cosplay. So if you are in the area and you want to come and do some baby metal cosplay and come to the panel, that would be great. Um, let me quickly go through the rest of the other things that I'm doing. Um, so I'm on a panel about ghosts. This is one of my ghost stories. Uh, I'm on, a, and then, and this is, this is a cool thing, which relates to, to metal music. Uh, that evening, like at 1130 at night, I'm on a special panel of people reading from their ghost stories with, um, metal accompaniment. And uh, Valentine Wolf, who I've seen a number of times at conventions, and they're great. It's uh, uh, a, a, an electrified cello and uh, female vocal um, is uh, is really cool. So. Not one of all the crowd to cry into thine hour of secrecy. They're going to be accompanying me as I read a section of Cold Bath Street, which is uh, one of my, the first of my ghost story series based in my hometown of Preston in Lancashire, set in the 1970s. This was the, the one that was uh, performed for audio by Christopher Eccleston, who is the ninth Doctor Who, and who is a fellow Lancashire lad, who I believe is going to be at Dragon Con. I've, I emailed him the other day. Uh, but I have not heard back. He's listed as one of the guests, so I'm hoping that I'll get together with him at some point. We usually get together for a pint when we see each other. Um, so that would be fun if he's there. Uh, what else? Um, so a lot of this stuff is going to be about writing. So in this case, this is one about um, whether to write a, a series or a standalone novel. Um, and then I'm on a couple of alternate history panels. Uh, this one, you know, will be focusing on um, how writers construct alternate history, a, a version of a fantasy which is grounded in a sort of tweaked version of, of real or historical events. So um, I'll be talking about that. Um, a, a panel on myth, magic, might, mean, mayhem. I, I didn't come up with this title, obviously. What's this about? Uh, oh, it's about researching myths and blending. I can't see properly. These glasses are rubbish for using the computer. Sorry. Um, but yeah, it's about uh, a, a panel on the kind of world building where it involves magic systems and the logic of how your fantasy dimension works to make sure that your stories are consistent, that they, they don't break their own rules, that they you don't paint yourself into a corner, you don't create... Uh, easy escapes for your uh, characters by using, um, you know, magical escapes of, of one kind or another that aren't justified within the logic of the story. Um, panel on writing young adult novels. Um, panel on creating characters so that they feel uh, real and not cookie cutter or cardboard. Um, this is a panel specifically for middle grade readers. Um, you know, young adult is usually, well, it depends, but usually sort of 15 and up thereabouts. Uh, middle grades is usually a little younger. It can, it can start as early as eight or nine and usually push up to like 13, 14. There's a, there's, again, there's a range. So this is a, a sort of young adult panel, which is aimed at books targeting a slightly younger audience. If you want to think of the distinction, the first three Harry Potter books are middle grade books. They become young adult books at the end of book four. Death of Cedric Diggory. That's the key. Um, this is a panel specifically for young writers. Teens want to write. 
um, this is a panel I was supposed to be on last year before the convention got uh, cancelled. Uh, this is about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and the uh, panelists all choose a season, which they then argue is the best season of Buffy. So you've got seven seasons to pick from. And I will be talking about season one. Which makes it harder because there's only 12 episodes. So, anyway. So I'll be talking about that. <coughs> Another alternate history uh, panel. This one is when the panelists all tell a story based on history. Some of them are true and some of them are lies. And the panelists and, and the moderators and the audience have to guess who's telling the truth. It's a bit like Call My Bluff, if anybody remembers that ancient British TV show. Um, where uh, and, and so all the panelists have sort of historical expertise and then they tell a story based on history, uh, but it might not be true. Um, okay. That's the lot. Uh, usually I do uh, separate signings and... Um, and, and book sales and stuff like that. I'm not doing that this time. Partly this is a pandemic thing. I'm more likely to keep myself to myself. So if you want to see me at some point, particularly if you want a book signed or something, come by one of these panels um, and, uh, and see me then, and I'll talk to you then, and sign books and what have you. So that's that. I'll put the, uh, the link to the website so you can go through the, the panel listings there again. I will also put the link to the Thank You Baby Metal video, which is the last video that I posted, um, and which I think came out really well because of uh, the, the contributions that other people made. And um, I would really love to, to see it get some more um, circulation. I think we're close to 9,000 views, which is great, but it would be nice to, to, to get more, particularly for when people, you know, search for a baby metal reaction video. And instead of watching people simply sitting there looking at a piece of music and saying, wow, that was cool, uh, it would be nice if they got to see people, you know, talking passionately about why they really love this band. So, you know, uh, again, I'll link that or, or put the, uh, the, the, uh, the link in the description below. Uh, so please, you know, keep um, checking that out and sharing it and, you know, drawing uh, whatever attention you can. And, you know, uh, it may be a little while before we get anything new from Baby Metal, which is... Um, to be expected, especially in the in the sort of current circumstances. But I'm excited to have this new music from other really interesting Japanese bands. I've talked here about um, Polka Dot Stingray and Atarashi Gakko and uh, groups like that who are producing new music at the moment um, and seem to have new albums in the works, um, new tour possibilities, at least for Atarashi Gakko, which I think is really interesting. Um, as they continue to push into the US market. So that's uh, so there's lots of great stuff going on. Um, and I will continue to to talk about that periodically here. I just had a birthday and um, uh, I was delighted to receive, among other things, the new uh, EP from Polka Dot Stingray, which has new material on it, but also has a great DVD of um, new versions of new sort of live stand-up studio performances of uh, songs, particularly from the third album from Nani Mono, um, which is really great, and I'm still uh, finding my way through that. I'm, I'm, I haven't actually talked about Polka Dot Stingray that much. Um, they don't really have much of a U.S. fan base, uh, but I, I'm on a, a mission to try and change that. So I may talk. I haven't done anything on the third album, so I might talk about the third album soon. I also have brand new baby metal guitar picks to go with my new um, Ibanez 7 string, which I am still finding my way around. So that's cool. Um, what else? Uh, I just took my son back to college in DC and en route spent some time traveling through deep through um, all the way up through North Carolina and into Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, uh, before going to DC. I'm a bit of a, um, an outdoors, 
a freak. I, I, um, I'm a bird nerd, among other things. So you're learning all kinds of stuff you, you never knew you wanted to know about me today. Um, and uh, so, you know, we went up, you know, we, we spent a lot of time on the east coast of North Carolina before east coast, as if there's a west coast. There's only one coast in North Carolina. It's on the east um, <laughs> from sort of the Wilmington area up through the Cape Fear River Basin and, and so on. And uh, this time we went up through the Outer Banks en route to Virginia. And on the straddling the border there is what is wonderfully called the Great Dismal Swamp. Best name, man. <laughs> the Great Dismal Swamp. And it is. And it's uh, completely deserted, or at least it was when we were there. Uh, and wild and remote and beautiful and I have never been more eaten alive by mosquitoes in my life. It was unbelievable. You get out of the car, especially in the woods, and a cloud sort of coalesces around you like smoke, and they just ravage you. It's it was astonishing. I mean, so much so that within like five minutes, we were like running back to the car. Um, and we kept trying to get out and wander in different places, but it was bad, man. How anybody ever used to live there in the 19th century. Imagine the um, Underground Railroad going through that area. It's just ugh, astonishing, astonishing. But also, it's a beautiful area. And one of the things that really... Um, and we, we saw a, a, a bunch of lighthouses and such in that area along the coast. Um, and um, I, 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 as I say, I love seeing birds and animals and such. I saw otter, uh, mink. I saw a wild American mink, which I, I don't think I've ever seen before. Um, and deer. I'm not, some of the damnedest thing when you're going through that area and you, the, so you're on this road and it's, the swamp is on either side of you and the sort of bracken growing up around the side of the road and you see deer, a group of deer. And as you come closer to them, they would sort of melt into the bracken and vanish. So much so that, you, and there, there's literally, you know, a foot beside, between the road and the swamp and you would pull up to where they were a second before and look and they were just gone, man. And And it makes you think, you know, I, I could totally believe, especially for like more primitive cultures, who you know, pre-scientific cultures, we put it that way, in in seeing these animals as sort of spirit creatures that just sort of melt into air. I'd never seen anything like it. It happened like four times. We'd see deer, we'd pull up to them, and they would vanish. And there was nowhere for them to go, right? Because there's just the swamp. And, you know, a few little bits of grass, and it's uh, absolutely astonishing. Tons of birds, you see a lot of uh, uh, great aigrettes and snowy aigrettes and uh, plovers of one kind or another uh, all along that area. But, but one of the things I was most excited about was, this is really hard to explain. This is a very British thing, right? When I grew up in the UK, I was a sort of amateur bird watcher, and practically all the boys I knew were. I lived in a, you know, industrial working class town, and one of the great things about bird watching was that it was cheap. In other words, you looked out your window and you look, oh look, there's a blackbird, or a blue tit, or a, you know, kestrel, or whatever. So it was something that we kind of all did a little bit. And you go out on your bike and look at birds and things. I don't mean it was like super hardcore, but it was something that a lot of my friends in school uh, had some interest in, you know. I'm always a bit baffled when, when people sort of have no concept of the birds and animals that live in their area, right? Because this is how I grew up, you know, even though it was an industrial town. Uh, it wasn't that far from the from the countryside. You'd drive a little bit north into the Ribble Valley, up to Pendle, wherever you know. Um, and um, uh, so, I had a poster over my bed growing up. Every British bird, and I would study it every night, pretty much. You know, I was that kind of kid. Um, and up 
in the corner was what was officially considered Britain's rarest bird, which is the osprey. Osprey's a, a fish eating hawk, very distinctive, you know. Um, beautiful, interesting bird with this sort of cranked wing, very pale uh, underneath with the sort of brown oversight and the crest on the head. And, I th and at the time, as I was a kid, you know, there were one or two pairs in Scotland fiercely protected um, after various sort of uh, problems with habitat loss and predation by collectors and, and what have you. So, you know, there were images of these, like one tree with a nest in it, surrounded by barbed wire and, and so on, I remember. And Ostreys have made something of a comeback in recent years, but they're still very, very rare in the UK. Um, and last time I was in Scotland, we made a special trip to go and see an osprey nest via a sort of remote camera, you know, and it's something that people do. Um, and it's funny because, you know, it, the ospreys were the bird that everybody wanted to see and nobody ever did, certainly not in, in Lancashire. Um, and if anybody ever claimed to have seen an osprey, you knew they were lying. We all used to lie about the birds that we claimed to have seen, but nobody would ever say osprey because that was a dead giveaway <laughs> that you were full of it, you know. Um, so an osprey was this impossible, remote, legendary bird for me growing up, you know, as it was, I think, for a lot of people. Um, so it was particularly strange to be driving along one of the long bridges connecting um, uh, North Carolina through Virginia and into um, uh, up into sort of the Maryland and Delaware areas and there are a series of very long bridges and on one of those bridges I saw 12 osprey flying directly overhead or perched on la you know lampposts it's the strangest feeling, you know, it's hard, really hard to explain it. I, and I, I immediately feel like a child again, you know, seeing, it's like looking at a phoenix, like looking at something a part of you doesn't really believe exists, you know. Um, this sort of metaphysical experience. And, and what's strange, of course, is that along that area, as that encounter demonstrates, they're quite common, you know, and you see the nests up on sort of platforms, these huge stick constructions, you know, um, and people will see them and recognize them for what they are and not feel it. And it's really interesting to me because it, it, it's one of those things that reminds you how much your own background and experience shapes your sense of the remarkable and the fantastic. Um, because it also shapes your sense of normal, right? The, the things that you grow up as being ordinary, uh, other people might find remarkable and strange and, and, uh, and, and beautiful or, 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 or fascinating in some ways. But then when you sort of encounter, I remember, you know, the first time I was in New York and looking at something like, I don't know, Statue of Liberty or, or Chrysler Building or... Um, uh, Empire State or any anything in New York and there's this sort of weird sensation of these are this is real this is real I've grown up knowing that these things exist but they're actually here in front of me and this part of the world has turned out to be real I felt it all the time when we were in Africa traveling around this is when I was researching for the steeplejack book series and, you know, seeing at close quarters lions and leopards and elephants and, I mean, wild, you know. Um, and, and and every time having this, it was like, it was like seeing, it was like, it was like Jurassic Park, right? You know, that, that sense of the literally awesome nature of these things that, can't really exist and it was it felt like that it felt like that you know seeing all these animals and you know that they're real sort of kind of but you've only ever seen them in zoos or in pictures or, or tv documentaries or whatever and to see them in reality does this sort of strange thing to your sense of the world you know it it, it sort of adjusts it and and it makes you 
makes you experience the moment more intensely. And I think this is one of the things about vacations, right? That, you know, for me, I will experience life more richly in 10 days of vacation than in the previous months. You know, and you find yourself trying to remember what you did last week or a month ago. It's like pff, every day is sort of the same. When you're on, on holiday and it, everything gets this sort of curious intensity because it's unfamiliar, you know. So this is part of my experience over the last couple of weeks. Why am I telling you this? You don't care, but you should. <laughs> Not because of my experience, but to think about it in terms of your own. Um, find those little things that are unusual, the, those little moments of the remarkable, the epiphanic, right? The, those little epiphanies where suddenly there's a moment of, of clarity or beauty or strangeness that you didn't see coming. I love that. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking to myself, presumably, because at this point everybody st stopped watching. That's okay. To bring things back to, to things that people may care about, uh, I will also include this link in case you didn't see it, my sort of general update about writing stuff um, from um, earlier this month, in which I talk about um, a book that I'll have coming out in the spring, which I'll talk more about at some point, called Burning Shakespeare, which is a sort of fantasy time travel adventure, comic, at least partly. Um, think Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett, that kind of tone, that kind of story. And the premise is it's a guy who, you know, uh, a, a, un a university administrator who hates Shakespeare so much that he sells his soul to the devil in order to go back in time and wipe him from history so that no one will ever read Shakespeare again. Uh, and uh, that's that's what the book is about. And then it's about um, a group of people who have recently died, uh, <coughs> who are put together by uh, what, for want of a better word, we'll call an angel, whose job is to somehow fix this, to go back into history um, and make sure that Shakespeare's plays survive into the present, um, for which, if they are successful, they get their lives back. So, you know, it's a what I hope is a fun and thought-provoking fantasy adventure. And thought-provoking, not least because some of the people assigned to saving Shakespeare think that the world might be better off without him, which is uh, sort of a fun thought. Anyway, uh, so there's that. Uh, also, since, it, you know, a lot of people watching this will have an interest in my sort of Japanese music and cultural stuff, I will say... I have to be a little careful how much I say. I have a new book. It's actually something I've been working on for several years. In some ways, it's something I've been working on for way longer. Um, and it's a book, which a novel, uh, a young adult novel, which involves a lot of Japanese um, folk myth and culture. Um, and it's about a young kid in North Carolina who's half... Um, Caucasian half Japanese um, and his sister growing up in a sort of in a rural town where they are um, kind of unusual where they don't really fit in and when they discover their uh, a sort of ancient magical heritage Japanese monsters coming out of the um, mountains of North Carolina bent on getting revenge for something done to them long ago by my uh, hero's ancestors. Um, this is a project uh, that has been in development for TV for a while, um, along with the Steeplejack books, which are in development for animation. Um, this is a project which uh, has been we've been working on for about four years. Uh, it's currently moving along really nicely. There's a, a great showrunner attached, um, and we'll see. Uh, you know, there's. I'm hoping that we will place the novel in the next few months, and that it will be out as early as next year or the year shortly after. It depends. Um, but um, you know, people who watch this channel might get a kick out of it. 
Um, there's even a baby metal reference. So passing reference, <laughs> passing reference. Um, but, you know, occasionally people, I think people assume that I make money off these videos. I make absolutely nothing off these videos. If you ever want to support this channel or support my existence generally, buy one of my books. Um, and, uh, um, and that will help me to sort of keep going. So anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll include this link as well, which talks a little bit about this. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, I say there that there's no news on secret machines or cathedrals of glass. That's not strictly true. I mean, it was true at the time that I posted this, but I had a, a, a really good meeting with Tom, uh, Tom DeLong, who, the lead singer of Blink-182, as was, and uh, Angels and Airwaves, Boxcar Racer, who I've worked with for a number of years. And he and I are having some really productive conversations about film and TV, where both of those projects, Cathedrals of Glass and the Secret Machines series, are concerned. Hopefully I'll have some more concrete news about that. Again, within the next few months, we shall see. Also, I know a couple of people are aware of my dog. This is Sherlock. <laughs> Sherlock is a um, Husky Great Pyrenees mix. He is nine years old and he scared us a little bit uh, by getting very, very stiff before we went away. And I was afraid that he was getting some serious arthritis and starting to show his age, which was a bit sad. But Though he's not moving very much right now, he is his old self. Funny Sherlock. Lazy animal. <laughs> oh, he jumped. <laughs> you gonna take a nice picture for the camera? Oh, you want your belly rubbed. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy, Sherlock. Oh, okay, okay, yes. The pro okay, okay, yes, 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 I will continue to rub your belly. That's, that's all good. All right. Enough? No, okay. All right, I gotta stop. Nobody wants to sit. Actually, they probably are more interested in looking at you lying there than they are about me talking. But okay, good boy. <laughs> enough, enough. Sherlock! Sherlock! Yes. <laughs> you got fur in your mouth, mate. Alright, okay, that's enough. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. So that's it. Uh, I am back to teaching at the moment. I'm teaching a young adult writing class at uh, UNC Charlotte. Uh, that's actually my only teaching for the semester. I am supposed to be teaching a study abroad spring break class, a Shakespeare class in the UK in the spring, pandemic permitting. I was also supposed to be teaching in Japan next year, next fall. Um, given the COVID situation out there, I don't know that that's going to happen. I may have to defer that for a year. We shall see. I'm not sure. So, uh, so that's it for now. This is my update. Um, if anybody's still watching, um, please like, comment, subscribe. And uh, if anybody cares about this kind of thing, I'll do it more often. Otherwise, I'll stick to talking specifically about music. Though I'll also talk about books and things as they come up. All right, that's it. Be good to each other. Stay healthy. Get vaccinated. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.